It's really my great pleasure to introduce Governor Mike Levitt, founder and chairman of Levitt Partners. He has served as a three-term governor of Utah and as secretary of Health and Human Services with George W. Bush's administration. As HHS secretary, he led the implementation of the Medicare Part D prescription drug program. And 10 years later, you all may know that 70% of Medicare enrollees are now in Part D. Governor Levitt also has a unique perspective for helping presidential candidates. He led the transition team with Romney Ryan, referred to as the gold standard by both Democrats and Republicans. And he continues to be a sought after advisor. I know Speaker Paul Ryan mentioned him recently as somebody he consults with regularly. Currently, he is a volunteer with the Center for Presidential Transition, housed in the Partnership for Public Service, and is available to both parties for questions about how to run the transition teams. Please join me in welcoming Governor Levitt to the podium. Am I the only Tom Clancy novel fan here? Any of you uh, read a Tom Clancy novel? So could I suggest that one of my favorites is a novel referred to as Executive Order. Uh, it is a, uh, a thriller that actually took place on Capitol Hill, where uh, the, the nation really gathered for the purpose of being able to uh, celebrate the inauguration of a new president. Regrettably, uh, there was a terrorist event, and bad things happened. A lot of people died, including the president and the president-elect and vice president-elect. And what unfolded in this novel was a question of who actually would be in charge in such a situation. I won't spoil the plot for you. You can read it, and you would enjoy it. What I will say is I suspect, having read that book, it was of particular interest to me when I was sworn in as a member of the President's Cabinet that I was taken by people, very serious people, who drive black cars to an undisclosed location, where um, it was explained to me that I would be, as a member of the Cabinet, line, in the line of succession that I would have certain obligations under that task. Now, I want to, you were never in any danger. I was a long ways down. <laughs> but it was a very serious task, and, and it should be. I was told two things. One is that I should always carry what you see in this picture in my wallet. It was a card presented to me that was a plastic card, and I was told that if there was any moment where the wrong things happened and there was a likelihood that something could occur, I should find a telephone, I should break that card open, and inside I would find a telephone number and some numbers that I could authenticate in the, in the right way. And if, in fact, it occurred, that would be the way in which I would demonstrate that I was the person to next be chosen as the president. Now, again, as I said, you are not in any danger. Uh, but the second thing is that because of I was in that line, uh, I would receive on a regular basis what all of you will know to be the President's morning briefing. Now, this is a, a process where a member of the intelligence community would come to my office. Uh, we would go to a specially prepared place where they would begin to describe for me uh, what was happening in the, in the world, and they would pull out a document stamped top secret. Uh, the process that was used very simple, basically, they come up with a series of uncertainties, and then they collect information from around the world, and they are then able to put it in front of a bunch of smart people, and they're able to say, when you look at the dots on this page of information, what picture do you see? And we can begin to tease out things that will help us understand what could or happen in the future, and if those are bad, how we could avoid them, and if they're good, how we could take, take them as an opportunity. It's a, process that is not just used in government, it's obviously used in any kind of a setting where decision makers are dealing with uncertainty. Well, it's obviously a very important process. 
as a man who was a veteran of this said, what we're looking for is we're trying to make sense of weak signals. If we're able to make sense of the weak signals, then we have the opportunity to take advantage of opportunity or to avoid disaster. This is a picture all of you will remember, having seen before. December the 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor. It's a day that the entire Pacific Fleet of the United States was lost. After that occurred, there were a lot of people wondered, how could that have happened? How could we have lost such an asset at one moment and have been so unprepared? Well, there were hearings that were held in places like this room where testimony was taken and studies were done and there were pages of weak signals that were determined to have been missed. For example, it was determined that we knew that the Japanese were not allowing access to any of their naval port, uh, uh, any, uh, facilities. We knew that they were gathering targets of British and, and Dutch and American sites. We knew that, in fact, there was a, 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 a report from the Secretary of Navy in war saying very easily they could attack Pearl Harbor. The day before this attack occurred, a ship was seen in Hawaiian waters. And maybe one of my favorite was December the 6th, or 7th rather, the day of the attack. At 6.40 AM, there was actually a submarine that was sunk by the USS Ward. And as they were coming back, they could hear explosions on the other side of the island. And the commander said to the first officer, oh, it sounds as though they are working on the road between Honolulu and Pearl Harbor. I think that's significant in the context of knowing the future because we often look at the future and try to put unusual events in the context of what we know and understand. So my purpose today is I hope that you'd think about what we're doing as really a, a, a kind of intelligence briefing, if you will, on the future of healthcare and where this is going and the weak signals and what they're saying. I'd like to talk about two things. Long term, will in fact fee-for-service payment be replaced by value payment? In my judgment, one of the most significant changes that's happened in health care since the widespread adoption of health insurance. And secondly, I'd like to talk short term what are the issues that will confront a new administration and the Congress in 2017, despite the outcome of the election? Now, what you'll see here is what's known as the diffusion of innovation curve. And this is a curve that is used whenever there is an innovation, whether it's the iPhone or whether it's a big change in the payment structure as we're going through today. I'd like to highlight this quote of Bill Gates. We always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years, and we'll underestimate what will occur in the next 10. His advice is don't be lulled into inaction. I'd like to talk a bit about what we all know today as ACOs, or accountable care organizations. A lot's been said about that, but the question is, what's actually occurring? This is a map in, the, in, in 2010. The splotches, the darker they are, the more there are. I'm just going to run through quickly 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015. It's, be, it's very clear that this method of payment is becoming more prevalent. Now, that doesn't mean it's predominant yet, but there is clear motion. These are the number, this is the number of hospitals in 2010 that were actually involved. 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015. You can see there's a lot of activity. The smaller open dots are those who haven't. There's still a lot to do. This demonstrates the number of contracts and the growth that's occurring. What, you can't see it in the back, but you can see the convergence of the lines. Basically what it says is, the weak signals are saying, there's still a lot of new contracts being let to do this between payers and providers. 
However, there are fewer new ACOs being formed, but more contracts as we move forward. This demonstrates a projection of how many lives currently we believe in the research we have done that there are roughly 28.3 million lives that are currently on, on some kind of payment structure other than fee for, just fee for service. Now, if you were to put that on this diffusion of innovation curve, you'll see we're right at the beginning of this process. And that's a very important point. We are just at the beginning, as much talk as there is, not very much yet has occurred, but it's clearly moving toward adoption. Now this, again, it's going to be hard to see in this big room, but could I just uh, point out that we've broken this into four cases as to how quickly it would occur and how complete it would be. The first one on the upper left is basically the base case, and if you can see a blue line and a red line, the red line is the is what we believe will occur, and, here, and the blue one is what's happened thus far. But you can see if, if things operate just as they were, that we'll get to roughly uh, 105 million lives by 2020 that will be part of this. To the upper right, this is a baseline without MACRA. I want to pause there and say quickly, MACRA was a very important piece of legislation, not just because of what it implemented, but because it demonstrated that there is bipartisan support for a change in this payment structure. Bottom left says, what happens if no one makes any money at this? Obviously, that means people aren't going to adopt it. What happens if they're wildly successful? So as you can see, there is progress being made. It will be somewhere between 40 and 177 million lives. We're it needs to be tracked very carefully, but the weak signals are clearly demonstrating that the change in payment is beginning to happen. Now, I'll just say we're not very good at this yet. There are a lot of people who are not ready for it, and the timing is a critical issue. But and from, from understanding where the future is going, this, in my mind, is a very significant development historically. Now I'd like to talk about what the weak signals are saying with respect to the new administration and Congress. Obviously, we have a campaign going, and we don't know who will control Congress in either chamber, and we're not certain who will be the president. But I'd like to suggest that there are at least three topics that I believe the new administration and the new Congress will be dealing with early in 2017 without respect to the outcome of the election. The first is the fragile individual market. 10 million people now are in the individual market as a result of actions that's been taken in the past. It, has, it is demonstrating currently to be fragile. Now, I will t I have, there are lots of reasons for that. Uh, I think it's predictable that at the end of this election, one party will say, see, we told you that would not work without a public option. We need to have a public option. Another, the other party will say, we told you if you didn't organize this market correctly, it would not function. And therefore, we need to go back and either change the system or we need to fix that problem. In the balance are 10 million people who have health insurance, and it's my belief that first of all, it needs to be re uh, responded to, and second of all, those of you who are involved in health care will be uh, involved in this debate in early tw uh, 2017. The second is the environment for Medicaid expansion and 1332 waivers. Obviously, not every state now have, has adopted Medicaid expansion. We're moving into a new administration. The new administration, whoever it is, will not be wedded to that of the past. If if, uh, if we have a president-elect Clinton, it seems likely to me that we will, in fact, begin to see a push for more Medicaid expansion. I think we'll begin to see more flexibility offered by the new administration as an incentive to do that. And frankly, I think we'll see state legislatures and governors who are willing to, to, to have that conversation. The 1332 waiver is a fascinating new development. It's coming effective this in, in January the 1st, 2017, where there's a tremendous amount of new flexibility built into the law. That could be interpreted in ways that could make it a boon to Medicaid innovation, 
or it could be used in a way as to say we're not changing at all. Time will tell. That is a conversation that we'll have in beginning in January. And lastly, pharmaceutical pricing. I won't delve into that. I think everyone is aware that that's an issue both parties are feeling needs to be focused on. Now, it's very rare that I have an opportunity to uh, speak to a group of people like you who are engaged in public service. And as a person who has, in fact, spent a good chunk of my professional life in public service, I'd like to take advantage of this moment to just give you a piece of advice. Uh, this is a picture that I took in 2002. Uh, in 2002, the state I was governor of hosted the Olympics, the Utah Olympic Winter Games. One of the great privileges of that is that I had the chance to go to Olympia, Greece and see the Olympic flame lighted. Um, this is the scene. These Olympic goddesses that you can see walked out of the woods. And one of them, one kneeling in the ground, held a torch. And she held it in an Olympic salute. And then she put some flammable material of some sort into that bowl that you see. It's concave. And suddenly the sun began to beat down on that bowl. And I could begin to see some smoke. And then that sound as the flame burst into being. It was the first time in many years of preparation I realized the Olympic flame is actually the sun. But she lighted the torch and she held it high and then from the side came another runner. This one wearing a uniform of the Utah Winter Games. Chills went up and down my spine as you might expect and that runner also held the torch and they held them up together. Whew. There was a transfer of the flame. The runner then turned and began to run and that exchange of the flame took place almost 12,000 times and the run traveled over 13,000 miles. What was fascinating to me is that everywhere the torch went, people came by the thousands to see essentially fire on a stick. <laughs> One day I'm with the woman who is organizing it. I said to her, I don't get this. Why do people come to see fire on a stick? She said, you're right, Governor, you don't get this. Let me explain it to you. Two weeks ago, she said, I went to an area where we had a gap in the runners, and I sent my assistant ahead in order to get a runner. And she went into an elementary school, and she said to the school secretary, quick, I need a runner but don't give me the student body president. Give me somebody that'll get a bit of a lift out of this. The school secretary said, I know exactly who you're talking about. And within about five minutes, they were dressing an undersized fifth grader in the Olympic uniform. Well, they went to the street and the runner began came closer, and as they approached, there was a meeting of those two flames. They lighted. And he took it with both hands and began to run down the street with tens of thousands of people on the side, including his classmates. The woman said to me last week, I got an email from the school secretary who told me what a great experience it was for their school. And then she said of the undersized fifth grader, he doesn't sit alone anymore. That, she said, is what the fire on the stick is about. It's about what it can do to the human condition. It's about what sport can do to bring us together as a people around the world. I tell you that story in the context of the service opportunity you have. Because as we talk about the weak signals, we're not talking about business models. We're talking about lives and we're talking about the opportunity that you have 
to be in a unique position to positively affect the lives of other people. So my challenge to you is that we keep the fire on the stick in our mind as we begin to think about the opportunity that lies ahead in the new Congress and in the new administration, and that we begin to look for solutions. And if we do, our country will stay a prosperous and good place. Thank you.